Advent here at Old Stonewall Farm and it's been a busy week. My husband just got done installing some lights in our pantry, some uh, recessed lighting in the pantry. I'm not too thrilled with it. I was quite happy with just lighting a candle and going in there but for some reason my husband wants lights. So it's been busy today but it is the second week of Advent and usually it is a Sunday where we hear from crazy John the Baptist out in the wild wearing clothing of camel hair and eating locusts and honey and he comes proclaiming a message prepare the way for the Lord prepare the way for the Lord but I want to jump forward to the Gospel of John where it opens up with that wonderful wonderful paragraph there was a man sent from God his name was John he came to testify to the light. He himself wasn't the light, but he came to testify to the light. So always in this time of Advent when we get John the Baptist and I hear about how he's proclaiming that the, the Savior is coming, I always think about the John Gospel prologue in which we're told that there was a man sent by God to proclaim the good word, but he himself wasn't the light. He just came to testify to the light. I love that because it makes me remember that I too have been named and claimed to testify to the light of Christ, to testify to all of you as to what God is doing, God's greatness and goodness, even amid challenges and struggles and darkness, God is still God. And that's a promise we can hold on to. God is still God. So the second week of Advent, we always get John the Baptist. But in addition to hearing the proclaim, you know, pro proclaim the news that, that Christ is coming, I want you to think about, about the prologue of John. And instead of saying there was a man sent by God whose name was John, he himself wasn't the light, but he came to testify to the light. I want you to put your name there. There was a woman named Anne. There was a woman named Christine who was sent by God to testify to the light. There was a man named, named Matthew. There was a man named Henry, John, Ken. who was sent by God to testify to the light. Each and every one of us is sent by God to testify to the light. Each and every one of us has a light story, <laughs> a story of radiance, how God just shone beautifully on our paths. And we need to share that. But here at the farm today, this kitchen is filling up with the scents, the fragrances of Christmas from the evergreen to the gingerbread that is in the oven to, to the cranberries I have here getting ready to make some cranberry chutney, which is delicious with turkey, let me tell you. The scents of Christmas and the holidays are just filling up this space. So today I want to spend some time with you talking about the power of fragrance, how the power of fragrance can really bring back to us many memories and emotions and why the power of fragrance has been used in, in religion, in churches, even in scripture, to echo back to a memory, to, to reignite in, inside of us a passion, of, 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 of a memory of what God has done. And so the fragrances of Christmas are ones that can be nostalgic, can be sad, can be happy, but the fragrances of Christmas are ones that do connect us with the past and renew us for the future. So I want to take a look at the sense of Christmas, the fragrances, and I'm going to be doing that by making a colonial decoration and we're going to be 
Um, I'm going to be sharing with you a uh, nativity hymn that I have discovered just a few years ago and I, I simply adore it. So I think I have to fix the, uh, the evergreen that kind of fell from the mantle and I see that Reverend is running back and forth. I just pray to God that Reverend doesn't decide to jump up the fireplace. He tends to do that. That would not be good. So my friends, thank you for coming to the farm and I can't wait to share with you my colonial decorations and that hymn that I discovered a few years ago. But right now we are going to um, enter into our second week of Advent by lighting the second candle of Advent around our wreath. Let us now turn to God's word. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are an aroma that brings death, to the other an aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. Well, I'm making some pomodoros for my home here, Old Stonewell Farm, because it's very colonial to take fruit and to study it with a whole bunch of cloves, and it smells absolutely beautiful. And it was a practice in early America to use such decorations for Christmas to make them as gifts. You would pierce the fruit with cloves and then let them dry, put a ribbon on them and hang them from um, the windows, from the mantel places and the fireplace. But the Pomodoro is not just a colonial American um, tradition. And in fact, in fact, only the rich would probably have oranges that are pierced with cloves because oranges were very rare and very expensive in colonial times. They weren't just go to the grocery store and get a bag of oranges. And so the oranges would be very, um, very, lavish to use that for your holiday decorating or even gift giving. Now, colonial Americans were not very big with Christmas. I discovered that just recently and um, I didn't realize that. In fact, Presbyterians, a little tidbit, Presbyterians frowned on the holly jolly holiday season in colonial America. It was usually just a day for solemn, Christmas was usually a day for solemn religious um, you know, reading the Bible and a meal, and that was it. So the oranges would be used by the rich, and um, others, other families would use the good old common apple and pierce it with cloves to make their pomander. And it's such a beautiful scent, really it is. And that got me thinking about a 17th century French nativity carol. Whence is that goodly fragrance blowing? And it's so beautiful and was written in the 17th century. So I guess um, the idea of fragrance back then was on a lot of people's minds because the pomodoro wasn't just used for decoration and all throughout history, the pomodoro was used to, let's be honest here, to disguise body odor. A lot of people didn't wash um, as often and bathe as often as we do now. And so, Pomodors were popular to disguise odors, and the pomodoro would be actually a gold um, circle, a gold case filled with spices and um, petals of flowers and everything to make it smell good. So in fact, over the years, pomodors were um, something, an accessory that the wealthy would have since it was made of gold. But the whole idea of fragrance and that French nativity carol that that sings the nativity and it starts off with whence is that goodly fragrance blowing and I'm thinking 
it's, it's such a beautiful carol. I love it. But I'm thinking, what does fragrance have to do with Christmas? And so when I thought about it some more, well, scripture tells us that we are to be um, the pleasing aroma of Christ out into the world. We are supposed to be that pleasing aroma to um, just impact other people, the, the scent of, of God, the fragrance of the holiness. Now, the whole idea of fragrance is all throughout the Bible as well. The use of fragrance is not just a powerful thing within the churches when you think about incense, but when you turn even to the Old Testament, you'll see that after the Israelites crossed over into, um, into the wilderness, when they crossed over from the Red Sea, they were instructed to have um, a tabernacle to worship God. And Moses instructed them to get the spices and the frankincense and, and all the yummy all the yummy smells to prepare so that when they worship God, there was this fragrance. So you had that back with the Israelites. And then also too, there was common practice for the, um, the priests who enter into the Holy of Holies, that the place in the, um, in the temple where only the priests could go in. And there in this room would be the place where the bread would be presented and then the incense would be burned. And so the whole idea of fragrance, it really has a psychological effect on us. It is, well, think about it. When, if, if I asked you right now to close your eyes and imagine the smell of, of a, an apple pie baking, close your eyes and imagine the smell of an apple pie baking. Now, what kind of memories does it bring back? Does it bring you back to a certain time, a certain place? And so there's a whole psychological part to, to fragrance that really jars our memory and, and brings us back to, to something that we need to remember. So when this French nativity carol begins with, whence is that godly fragrance flowing? Where is it going? The carol begins with, you know, where's this fragrance going? Where is it blowing? It makes me wonder, well, what is the fragrance of Christmas? And what is it trying to, to, to remind us, to speak to us? Fragrance is used in religion a lot with incense and it echoes back to scripture, but even in other religions, it's used in certain areas in China, I, I discovered that for families, when they get together, when they want to share their stories or remember something of the past and, and, and recall a, you know, a funny story about grandma or something, they would pass a bowl around of spices, of fragrance, and they would pass it around and then they would, they would smell it and that would jar their memory, and then they would share their story. So when this carol sings about fragrance, I think about the fragrance of Christmas. Whence is that goodly fragrance flowing? Where is it going? And then when you think about the next line of the fragrance, the, the, the song, it basically says that it echoes back to a field in spring, in May, that the shepherds would be in. It, it kind of reminds them of a, of a field in May, the flowers blooming that the shepherds were in. And I wonder if that's what they're talking about, the fragrance of Christmas, the evergreen, the cloves, the mulled cider, the gingerbread baking in the oven, fresh bread coming out of the oven used for, for a special supper. What are the fragrances of Christmas trying to, to wake us up to, to remind us about something? Well, when this story, this song says about the shepherds in the fields in May, I remember an old um, tale from, from Jewish tradition. And it turns out that a boy had a cattle that just wasn't 
um, healthy anymore. And he was so upset because that cattle would be, you know, the very thing that would help his family stay alive. And so he was so disappointed in himself that he couldn't keep the cattle alive that he took off and he showed up to the door of a rabbi and the rabbi took him in. But the other students didn't like this boy that joined their class because he just smelled his, his you know, he was out and about. He was a, a farmer. He was, a, a, you know, out taking care of the cattle. And he was probably just living on clods of dirt was what this Jewish, this writing was saying. And so his breath probably smelled and he probably smelled and the wretched students didn't like him being there. And the rabbi said, no, 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 no. Right now you might not smell the best, but once you have knowledge put into you, you will be fragrant. And so I wonder if that 17th century French nativity carol, when it mentions the fragrance, where is it going? And then it mentions the shepherds in the field, the flowers. I wonder if that was the nod to how the shepherds' lives were changed that Christmas Eve, that Christmas night, that holy night, when shepherds who were looked down upon were the first ones to get the good news, that they were the ones chosen for something special, that, that God would come into their lives and lift them up from the lowly status that they had and that they were worthy, that they were worthy. Perhaps the fragrances of Christmas are to remind us how God broke into the world. The fragrances of Christmas are to remind us that we all can change, that there is an opportunity to be new again. Whence is that goodly fragrance flowing? Where is that goodly fragrance going this Christmas? If we are to be a sweet aroma pleasing to the Lord and, and out there in the world, well, what is it that God is trying to remind you this holiday? of how worthy and beautiful you are. So my friends, smell the evergreen, smell the gingerbread baking in the oven, smell the, the warmth, the spiciness of the cloves and oranges as you make your own pomodors. <laughs> smell the fragrances of Christmas and each time, each time you take a whiff Remember that God wants us to share the goodness in this world just as God shared the goodness at Christmas with all. As I was making these, I said to my husband, I said, you know, these are just going to be Christmas presents for everybody this year. And he looked at me and he's like, oh, okay, you know, the reaction will probably be, how cheap can this accidental country pastor get? An orange and clothes and a ribbon. How cheap can I be? But yet, there was a time when this wasn't looked upon as a cheap gift. There was a time when this would have been received as something precious something valuable, something worthy. And so perhaps the fragrance of Christmas, the fragrance of Christmas is to remind us that we just can't take for granted who's in our life. We can't just take for granted what we have. And the things that we look down upon are really the most precious, the most priceless. Whence is the goodly fragrance flowing? And so my friends, why don't you make 
why don't you make a bowl this holiday season of goodly fragrance that will remind you the fragrance of Christmas, a reminder of just why we celebrate, a reminder of how loved we are by God. is that goodly fragrance flowing stealing our senses all away never the light did come up blowing shepherds from flowery fields in May whence is that good Thank you.